Meta. As you know, my name is David. I'm the creator and host of CVS. In this episode of Meta, I'm just going to talk a little bit about selling your soul. What could someone conceivably offer you for your soul? Could it be something as ordinary as money? Who owns the gold? Who owns the silver? I often think about that scene in the gospel where Jesus says, render unto Caesar those things that belong to Caesar, and render unto God those things that belong to God. I always imagine Caesar with his purses overflowing with all the silver that has been rendered unto him. I picture Caesar himself being given into the hand of God, into the purse of God, This is Caesar's destiny after all. He is to be rendered unto God because he is of God. Everything is being offered to God, everything. In the creation story of Genesis, we have an unfolding of the lower forms of creation, the lowest forms of life, and then higher forms of life, higher forms, and then eventually creation is crowned with man. And man is fulfilling this role. Man is created and called for the priesthood to offer praise and glory to God and to offer on behalf of all non-human animals the plants and the trees and the mountains and the rocks and the rivers and the streams and everything, even the sun and the moon. Mankind stands in place of all creation and offers as a priest, he offers sacrifice to God Most High. And we are rendering everything unto God because everything is of God. Now, in the case of Satan and the demons, And sadly, in the case of humans that ultimately say no, they have foiled their destiny. They have said no, because they are free to say no. And you and I are free to say no, or we're free to say maybe, we're free to say complete nonsense or to keep silent. But the silence is a no. The maybe is a no, not yet, I'm not ready is a no, later on my deathbed is a no, when the church aligns with my worldview is a no. All of these answers, which are not yes, are actually a no. So we have to say yes, explicitly, clearly, unambiguously, in an unqualified and unconditional way, we have to say yes. Christ is the bridegroom, we are the bride. We have to say yes when he proposes to us. Anything else other than a clear yes is a no. That's reality. Crying about it, complaining about it, or trying to find logical loopholes is a complete waste of time. We just need to say yes. You're in or you're out. It's just like Noah's Ark. It's obvious that Satan is the prince of this world, and when he was tempting Jesus, he offered him worldly power. So does that belong to Satan? Can Satan offer us power and privilege and honor? Is it possible that he can offer us these things and use them to buy our soul? Of course not. Power is good. Power is of God. Just as we don't own gold and silver, we don't own power, we don't own honor. We participate in the blessedness of God, in the power of God, in the honor of God. Even Satan himself participates 
in the goodness, the power, and the glory of God. It just so happens that he has renounced God, and he has declared himself sovereign, and he is falling away from God and all of the infinite perfections that God is. So his participation in God's goodness is waning, whereas the saint in the church militant, or the saint-to-be, is waxing in his participation, on average. From moment to moment, there may be highs and lows and ups and downs. He may be taking one step towards Satan, two steps towards Jesus, but the average movement is toward God. This is what it is to be a Christian in the church militant. Of course, in the church suffering, there are no more steps being taken towards Satan. We're only moving toward God. There's a process at that point, once you're in purgatory, you are guaranteed salvation. You are in. You are on your way to heaven. You're just being purified. So that is no longer possible to flirt with Satan and to do the dance that we do here below in the church militant. And of course, once you're in heaven, uh, there's absolutely no question of participating in such schizophrenic behavior. But here below in the church militant, we do dance around and we do say yes and no and yes, yes, no, yes, 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 no, no. And it's a little bit of back and forth and hesitation. And we are in danger. There's a real danger of falling. And there's a real danger of eternal damnation. But my point here is that all power is of God, so we cannot be purchased by offers of power. So what other possibilities are there? What else could Satan potentially use to purchase a precious human soul for himself? What about love? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that Satan isn't exactly overflowing with love. So he's not going to have a lot to offer that way. What about suffering? Maybe there's some sort of twisted notion of sacrifice. I have suffered, Satan says to your precious soul, I have suffered more than any other creature. I alone am the prince of darkness. I abide in the darkest recesses of hell for all eternity. I suffer more than any creature, and I have suffered infinitely. So in my own twisted way, if love is about sacrifice and sacrifice is about suffering, then even though I can't love, it's only because I suffer so much. So I will offer you my suffering. It's true that he suffered more than any other mere creature, but Jesus Christ is both God and man, and in his humanity, because his humanity is hypostatically united with his divinity, he's one person, he's a divine person with two natures, human and divine. In his human nature, he suffered more than Satan. It's shocking to think about that. It's really horrible to think about that. It's mind-boggling. It's disturbing. We should lose sleep over that. We should go to confession and confess all of our sins right away because we contributed to those infinite sufferings. If you want to think about Satan's suffering, you can think about it as infinite if you want to, but it's nothing compared to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. It really is nothing. Objectively speaking, now, subjectively speaking, obviously the sufferings of Satan are not negligible. Meditating on those sufferings, I think, would bring any sane person into the confessional and back into the safety of the Ark, the Catholic Church, outside of which there is no salvation. We should all be trembling with fear when we meditate on the sufferings of Satan. They are disturbing and they are real, and we can participate in them if we, God forbid, say no to God and yes to the lies of Satan, we can be participating for all eternity side by side with that horrible, stinking monster.
who was once the greatest and the most glorious angel in heaven before his fall. So we need to bear in mind the perplexing qualities of these infinities. When we start comparing infinities, the mind soon grows weary and we, we just can't, we don't have the capacity to understand it. But we do know by pure reason and we do know by the teachings of the church that Christ's sufferings are greater than anyone else's, including Satan. The warning here, obviously, as I've tried to tell you, is don't take the sufferings of Satan lightly and don't take your own sufferings lightly, the sufferings that you will have to endure if you say no to God. Because a lot of people think that there's going to be a fun party in hell, but it is it is infinite suffering for everybody. There are degrees of hell, but it will matter very little to you when you are suffering in hell, that your infinite suffering is somehow mysteriously less than the infinite suffering of the guy next to you. You won't care about that. That will give you no comfort whatsoever, so please avoid hell at all costs. But the point of this thought experiment is simply to say that Jesus Christ suffered more than Satan, not less. The difference is, of course, that Jesus Christ suffered for a reason. He suffered for a purpose. He suffered for you. He suffered for me. So no, Satan has no currency in the realm, even of suffering. He has nothing. He has literally nothing. And that is, by the way, the Catholic definition of evil. It is Nothing. It is a falling away from the good. It's the falling away from being. It's the falling away from goodness, truth, beauty, and every other perfection of which God is the source and the summit. So I sold my soul to God. And the way that came about is that I was, first of all, baptized as an infant. I thank God for that. I thank my parents for that. And I thank the Protestant minister who performed that baptism. One of my favorite saints, St. Saint Louis de Montfort, took the name de Montfort because he was baptized in the town of Montfort. That's how much St. Louis de Montfort valued baptism. So baptism is a big deal. That's where it began for me. And then came the rebellion at age 14. I drifted away from God. I became sovereign. I became God Almighty. I became the one who says, I am. Of course, at first at age 14, I wasn't consciously aware of making myself God. But over the course of 25 years of atheism, I did come to understand explicitly that I am God. And in this, I was explicitly identifying as a solipsist, among other things. But I hadn't sold my soul to Satan. I had simply taken charge and I had simply assumed the role of God. I decided what is good and what is evil. So morality was no longer objective, it was subjective. And the truth was no longer objective, it was subjective. And the physical universe was no longer objective, it was merely subjective. The point of recounting this is just to say that I never sold my soul to Satan, not explicitly. Satan merely tricked me into assuming the role of God. He was able to trick me because I was eminently trickable. I was foolish. I still am. I was weak. I still am. I was sick. And I still am. Sick in the head, sick in the heart, sick in the soul, sick in every way. So Satan was able to fool me, and I was a willing victim, and I, I listened eagerly as he tickled my ears with his lies. Some 
people are worried about having sold their soul to Satan. Movies and books and even some rock and roll music give the impression that we can sell our souls to Satan, but we can't because he has nothing with which to purchase our souls. So it's an impossible transaction. It just it never happens. We, of our own accord, sever ties with God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Ghost. And in doing so, we renege our claim to inherit life and to inherit everything that comes with being a son of God. Beauty, goodness, truth, health, justice, life, and every other perfection. There is only one divine nature. There is one God. We're not polytheists. We're monotheists. We are the only true monotheists. Everyone else is participating to a greater or lesser extent in monotheism, in Catholicism. This is what Vatican II took pains to explain, and it's not easy to understand, and it's not easy for me to respond to the aggressive questions of a Stephen Heiner or any of the set of cantists that I have on my show. But it is as plain as the nose on your face that the truth subsists in the Catholic Church which means that there are elements of the church available outside of the ark, but all of those elements come from inside the ark, and they're all designed to bring everyone that's currently outside of the ark into the ark. That's the whole point. So there is no salvation outside of the ark. Get in the ark. And how do you get into the ark? By means that came from within the ark. So there really is only the inside of the ark. Just yesterday I bought myself an icon of Noah, and I think about him often, and uh, I admire, love and admire him. He was one of my arch enemies when I was an anti-Catholic, anti-Christian Satanist. He was on the top of my list of people that I loathed and despised. And I used to mock and ridicule Noah all the time. But my point is, the reason I'm talking about Noah is because there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, just as there was no salvation outside of the Ark of Noah. And before the doors were sealed, Noah went about inviting people in, sharing the good news. This is what it's all about. The ark is the ark. Get into the ark. But Noah is wandering around before the doors are sealed. He's wandering around freely. These are elements of Catholic truth that are floating around. When he talks to two people, and those two people talk to two people, and those two people talk to two people, and so on and so forth, and they end up starting some sort of Noahidic cult, which is actually something that happened, by the way, because he was building his ark for about a century. So there were Noahite cults that were cropping up, and those are elements of Catholic truth. Those Noahite cults had elements of Noah's truth, Catholic truth that saves. Now, were those elements acknowledged in such a way that drew the people into the ark finally? Well, that's the salient point, isn't it? If so, great. That's what they're there for. If not, so much the worse, because that was the point. It was to bring people into the ark. If you didn't get into the ark at the end of the day, it didn't really matter how cute your cult was and how many elements of Noah's saving truth that cult taught and revered and how much incense they burned. It didn't matter. The point was those saving elements were there so that you could be saved. It's the same thing today. If we look at Scientology, there are elements of Catholic saving truth in Scientology, undoubtedly and undeniably. All truth belongs to us Christians. This is what St. Justin Martyr famously said in the second century. He had been, of course, a pagan, and he converted to the Catholic faith. He got in the ark. And as the dogmatic constitution on the church famously said in Vatican II, 
the church with its visible hierarchy is one reality. It, it is both human and divine. It's an extension of the incarnation. And the church subsists in the Catholic Church. To say, as Stephen Heiner suggested, that the church is the Catholic Church is true, but it ignores certain realities about our world, which hinge on the fact that God and God alone is sovereign, and that God is the master of all, and that God alone is able to purchase our souls. We either let God purchase our soul, or we sell our soul to God, or we foul our soul, we spoil our soul, we mar and destroy our soul, which of course does not belong to us, but we have treated it like it did belong to us, which is the very thing that deforms our soul. So this church, it subsists in the Catholic Church, which is of course governed by the Pope and the bishops in union with the Pope. But as the dogmatic constitution on the church says, there are elements of sanctification and truth to be found outside of her visible structure. There really are. This is reality. To say otherwise is not just naive or silly, it is absurd, it is dualistic and Gnostic. It is unjustifiable, it is certainly not Catholic, so I don't see how the set of the Cantists put up any sort of counter-argument against the use of the word subsists in. It must just be that they haven't thought about it, they haven't understood the ramifications, the implications of this nuanced teaching of Vatican II. And of course, Vatican II is building on Vatican I and Trent and all the other councils that came before and all of tradition and the fathers and holy scripture. So we do well to listen to Vatican II. So the document goes on actually to say that these elements of sanctification and truth, which are found outside of our visible structure of the church, these elements as gifts properly belonging to the Church of Christ, possess an inner dynamism toward Catholic unity. This is the point that I wanted to make, that when Noah went out preaching, the point of his preaching was to get people into the ark. God is one. So we triumph in God or we burn in hell with Satan for all eternity. Those are the two options. I am the triumphalist because I say yes to God. By God's grace and with God's help, God help me to persevere in that yes. And God help me to root out the pride and the sin that lurks behind my weak yes. But I have faith, not in myself, but in God and in the saints and in the holy souls in purgatory that I will with their help, make it to heaven. But the reason I'm emphasizing this oneness, this triumphalism of the church, is because if I look at those outside of the ark who are benefiting, potentially and actually benefiting from the elements of sanctification and truth that are found outside of the ark, Many of them have God. Many of them even recognize the Trinity, the triune God. Most that recognize the Trinity also recognize that Jesus Christ is the God-man, God incarnate, who took on our flesh and suffered and died for our sins. So there are people who have even that in common with the Catholic faith. There are even schismatics that are even closer to the Catholic faith who believe that the Catholic Church is the one true church, but who separate themselves from the true Pope and the true bishops in union with the Pope. And so it seems to me that the Pope and the bishops in union with the Pope, in other words, the living magisterium, is the most important 
fact of religion. It is the most important doctrine of religion. The Pope and the bishops are the most important people on this planet, and they are the most important people in the universe. And they are more important even than God himself because they and they alone have the keys to the ark. They and they alone can let us in. They and they alone can bind and loose. And if you have the Pope, and if you have the bishops who teach in union with the Popes, in other words, if you have the living magisterium, then you have everything else, starting with God the Father, and then God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the Incarnation, and, and the sacraments, and the Church, and the Saints, and Mary, and you get everything. If you submit yourself to the living magisterium, to the current valid, licit Pope today, and those bishops who are faithful and are in union with the Pope, you have everything. If you don't have the Pope, you don't have anything. You have nothing. That's why I'm willing to make the controversial statement, and I'm willing to say that the Pope is the most important person in my life, more important than God Almighty. If you're close, if you're close the way the set of the Cantists are close, if you've got everything but the Pope, it seems to me you're in trouble. You're outside of the Ark. So I am confident that the Pope is where it's at. This is the ecstasy of Catholicism, is that my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. We are astonished. The words of Christ astonish us. Everything that Jesus did and said was astonishing. Not because it's perverse, but because it's not perverse. And when we encounter something that's not perverse, something that's pure and holy and good and godly, we are astonished. And so I think that's the way it is with a lot of Catholic truths, which are counterintuitive. The world has seeped in. We're in the world and of the world. We're not supposed to be of the world. We're supposed to only be in the world. So when we're shocked, when we're astonished by Christ or by the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, we are encountering purity, holiness, goodness. We are encountering those thoughts which are not the world's thoughts, those ways which are not the world's ways. So I encourage you, I really do encourage you, whoever you are, Think about the elements of sanctification and truth that you recognize in your worldview. Whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Jew, a Protestant, Orthodox, or even a Catholic, whatever worldview you have, whatever you think is true, whatever religion you adhere to, Never stop examining those elements of sanctification that you find and ask yourself, do they belong to Jesus Christ? Do they emanate from Noah's Ark? Are they pointing you in to a place of safety to protect you from the coming floods? Ask yourself, who gets the credit? Ask yourself, who can afford to buy your soul? To whom would you sell your soul? And if you're not willing to sell your soul, are you the master of your soul? Is it yours? Is it truly yours? Do you possess it? Do you love it? Do you want to hold on to your life? I think we know what that leads to. Jesus was very clear and unambiguous. If you love your life, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And not for a day, you will lose it for all eternity. So if you are willing to lose your life, if you're willing to sell your soul. In a way, you will have purchased that pearl of great price. You will be saved, ultimately. So I want you to think about the subsistence of sanctification and truth and how it flows from one source. It only flows from one source. And I want you to head toward the ark, the open door before it's sealed, before it's too late. Get in. If you're not Catholic, become a Catholic. Join the church. Look up where you can find RCIA. Find yourself a good church. 
find a Catholic church that's Catholic, not in name only, but that is actually adhering to the truth of Christ, that is submitting to the living magisterium. Find out. Don't be afraid to ask. I've asked many priests, point blank, are you Catholic? And you can tell when they answer the question if they are striving to be Catholic or not. It doesn't matter if they're perfect. It doesn't matter if they're a sinner. It doesn't matter even if they're a pedophile. What matters is, are they repentant? Do they give their life to Christ? Are they struggling? Are they striving? Are they sincere? Are they like a little child that loves and trusts their father? If so, great. If not, run far, far away and find a real Catholic church, a real Catholic priest, and join the Catholic church while you still have time, because we don't know when Christ is coming again. Don't believe the rumor that says that he's coming over here and over there, but prepare yourself. Get into the ark now. Because those people that refused to get into Noah's ark, they weren't stupid. And yet they perished. Why? Because of their pride, because they refused to submit. They refused to sell their soul to God, the one and only God. So, Find yourself a way into the ark. And if you are already in the ark, stay in the ark and do everything you can to bring your family, friends, enemies, and acquaintances, and all those that you know in with you. So that's it. God bless. Take care. We'll talk soon.